It's high stakes, it's high fun, it's commodities trading at its best. If you like action party games, then this game might be for you. Number 51 on Mike Selinker's 100 games you absolutely, positively must know how to play. Pit. Hi, my name's Dave Adams and I love playing games. At the 2015 PAX convention, one of my favourite game designers, Mike Selinka, presented his list of top 100 games you must absolutely, positively know how to play. The 100th game on the list was a challenge to play a game of my own design. With a desire to understand more about the hobby that I love so much, I've taken on that challenge to design a game, but first I need to learn as much as I can about game design. I'm going to start by playing as many of the games on Mike's list as possible. Join me as I learn more about the core mechanic. Published in 1904 by Parker Brothers, Pit was designed by Edgar Case, who was either inspired by or redeveloped the game Gavit Stock Exchange, created by Harry Gavit of Topeka, Kansas in 1903. The game plays between three to eight players in around five minutes. Let's see how it's played. Commodities are selected so that there is one per person. Each commodity has a specific value and that is used for scored play. The bear and the bull are included as wild cards. The bull can substitute any card and if a player wins with all nine commodities and the bull, they score double points. A player cannot win if holding the bear. If a round ends and a player has not collected enough commodity and is holding the bear or bull, that player loses 20 points. Players are dealt nine to 10 cards depending on if the bull and bear are in play. A player will generally look at their hand and decide which commodity to keep and which ones to trade. When play, play starts, each player will simultaneously hold out a number of cards to declare and shout out the number they are trading for. They will trade with a person willing to trade that same number. Trade continues around the table until a player scores nine cards of one commodity and does not have the bear. That player yells pit, hits the bell in the middle of the table, and the ground comes to an end. Now there's a lot to say about Pit, but before we do, I want to give some time to Edgar Case, the designer of the game, who later in life became well known for his psychic predictions and became sort of like the, one of the original Jonathan Edwards, uh, that showman, that well-publicized and very popularized psychics. He's worth looking into if you get a chance. And although I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it here because I want to focus on the game, he's definitely worth a Google search. Give it a go. Now, Pit was designed off of the Chicago Board of Trade, which was also known as the Pit. In the Pit, if you've ever seen any 1980s trade film, and you see people in the stock exchange calling out in that downstairs area, yelling up at the boards and people writing commodities up on blackboards in the olden days or electronic ones more recently, that area is called the Pit. And it's that open cry bidding and that exchange of commodities that Pitt's meant to imitate. The idea of an open cry bidding system is to create a fair and equal system which people have a chance to both get a sense or, or some sort of insight into the person making the trade and, and to make more informed or better informed decisions. And it also creates a sense in which people are able to provide or at least put in for the best possible uh, offer to make an offer on all commodities being traded at the time. Now, more recent days, the pit has disappeared or it's at least become obsolete as we've moved to more electronic forms. That's actually created a bit of tension in the stock exchange with people who say that the, the open cry system was more honest and it was, gave people a better insight into the, the, the exchange between buyer and seller. And those who say, well, maybe that's true, but the electronic system is faster, it's more efficient, and it costs, it's more cost effective. I'm not going to get into that debate here. Now, to summarize the mechanics simply, it's a set collector. You just need to collect your set before anyone else, which is translated into through the conceit of you're trading for commodities and you need to corner the market before anyone else. If you corner the market first, you get to cry out pit and hit the bell or the board, whatever you've got there at the time. That little added bit extra means that if two people corner the market at the same time, it's the person with the quickest reflexes that gets the win. 
But Pit is so much more than just a set collection game. In fact, in this one little game and in such quick gameplay time, you're actually teaching some really fundamentals of economics uh, in a time when education is lacking in the economics field. It teaches kids about scarcity, it teaches kids about uh, gains through trade, and it also teaches kids about using minimal information and pairing that with beliefs about the current market to make decisions which are as informed as possible, but may also take a little bit of risk. This game has been picked up by mathematicians and teachers alike for that very ability to really teach kids deep lessons about economics and trade in such a simplistic, well-rounded game. Now, this is to say nothing of the fact that Pit has been very valuable to people studying the field of game theory. Game theory explores the mathematical models of conflict and cooperation between informed, rational decision makers. It's been used in such fields as economics, but also psychology, uh, wartime tactics and strategies and troop deployment, uh, as among many others. Game theory was developed by mathematicians that worked on the Manhattan Project and was continued through other people such as John Nash, who was played by Russell Crowe in a movie called A Beautiful Mind. Now, Pitt provides a great exploration for exploring the decision-making that people make and bringing about optimal outcomes for themselves. As a zero-sum game, my winning comes at the expense of others losing, and any decision I make will come either from me trying to increase or optimize my outcome or to decrease or minimize your outcome. So I'm really in direct competition with you and my winning always comes at the expense of others. Now to understand the game better, it's good to try and break it down into its parts. Each part provides different amounts of information and it's what you do with that information that makes the difference in the game. For instance, when the cards are dealt, the dealing of the cards, there's an amount of information. All cards are dealt face down, but at least you know already, before you even pick up the cards, that all sets are in play. All commodities are currently in play and up for grabs. When you pick up your cards, you are then provided additional information, such as, uh, well, for starters, what commodities do you have? If you've got more of one commodity than than the other, you might consider it advantageous to try and go specifically for that commodity. However, over the course of several games, if you're trying to keep track of scores or points, you may realize that that commodity may not be enough to win you the game or at least try and get you closer to or over the edge or optimizing your position in the overall game or state of things. So you realize you might have to trade that away. You also know that someone is going to have a bear or a bull or both. Now, the bear card is a strict disadvantage card. To own it is to be at a disadvantage immediately. The bull card, on the other hand, is an advantage or disadvantage. Now, in the midst of trading commodities, it seems like a clear advantage unless someone corners a market before you do, at which point when it comes to scoring, it's an outright disadvantage. The other thing you know is the amount of time going through. Time is a factor in this game. The longer the amount of time, the closer you know that someone's getting to cornering the market. And that's when you start to really consider the bear issue and the bull issue. Trying to get rid of the bear at all times is a must, but the bull is a little bit harder. It provides you the advantage of being one card closer to whatever set you're collecting, but as you start to push time on and as you are slowly moving forward, you realize maybe you haven't cornered the market yet. You might be four cards away from cornering the market. That could seem like a lot in those later stages of the game. And it could mean that that bear could cost you big points if you're doing a scored round. So these decisions are important. The other decisions you have is in the state of trading cards. With each card being traded, you're receiving little bits of information and you're making decisions based on what you know and the beliefs you have about the state, current state of play. Now, if you've kept your cards and you're building your set, you know that those cards are not in play. But also, you know which cards are moving through your hand so you know which cards may be collected. Now that could mean that some cards are coming in quite regularly, su suggesting that nobody's really collecting that set, which could mean that someone is also collecting the same set as you. So at this point, you're left with a decision. 
do you break up your cards and start to trade them out and collect the other set in the hopes of getting a, a commodity that nobody wants, which means it's probably more likely to come to you at, at a faster and more ready service? Or do you hold on to it in the hopes that the other person decides to trade away theirs, meaning that you're going to have a sudden influx and the potential of cornering that market quicker? Whatever decision you make, you know that you're both being disadvantaged and providing advantage to other players in the game at any time. Now, ideally, you wouldn't try and trade all four away just in the case that you did uh, give them to the person who was also trying to collect that set. However, you can break them up and you can try and spread them around the group and get them moving, but they're out in play then. And suddenly you know that they're now on offer to whoever is trying to collect them. Now, it should be noted that this game is not just about economics and education and maths and all of that learning stuff. The game is also fun. And I'd actually forgotten how fun it was. Now, I've never actually played Pit by that name before I got the game. However, I had played it in other versions such as Billionaire. It's also gone by other names such as uh, Flax and Corn and Commodities. Um, different versions are played. Pit is the original and it's really quite fun. In fact, I pulled it out to sort of go through it with a couple of friends, and in fact, not even gamer friends, and they remembered it as Billionaire as well. And we sat down at the table ready to play this game, and they, they were doing it more as a favor for me, but almost instantly, everyone was sucked into it. We played for over an hour of just repeating to going through and just drawing, shuffling together the cards and dealing them out and playing again. Games going for less than five minutes sometimes. Good, fast action that just kept us motivated and going for over an hour. And that's a, that's a real, I think, that's a really great thing about this tiny game. Is a game that can play in five minutes, but we obviously played, ugh, you do the maths on how many games we played to do, take more than an hour. The game is still a game that I would happily pull out at a party. In fact, I took it to school and played it with the kids and introduced it to grade threes, fours, fives, and sixes and had them all wrapped, all begging for more. This game is fun. Everyone's engaged. There's no, no downtime. It's loud. It's, it, it's engaged. Yeah, everyone's yelling. It's full of laughter. People getting the same cards and trading exactly the same things and then just stopping and laughing and then quickly moving on to get cards pushed through. And then whenever someone hits that bell and yells out pit, everyone takes a breath, gives a deep sigh, and then can't wait to shuffle the cards up again. This game is brilliant. And I have no problem seeing why this game is on Mike's list. From a design perspective, it's simple. It comes together beautifully. It requires very little language skills uh, to understand English. You've got the pictures which tell the whole story. And if you're doing a scored version, then all you need to know is two, three digit numbers. It's very simple that way. This game just works so beautifully, so smoothly. And the idea that Every card you need is already in play. You know that those cards are active in the field and that it's just about the interplay of people that makes the difference. And that person interaction, I think, is such a clever, great mechanic that just works so beautifully. Getting people talking and yelling and, and having fun just created such a great euphoric sensation that I just couldn't wait to go back for more. And I still love pulling it out and playing Pit today. This game was brilliantly designed and has lasted over a hundred years, suggesting that maybe this is a very clever game design and one certainly worthy of being on Mike's list as well as in my own collection. Thanks for watching. I'd love to hear from you in the comments below. Maybe you've got a great Pit story or you've got a game, a good commodities game that you think stands the test of time. I challenge any of you to come up with a brilliant game that's lasted over a hundred years like Pit. But until then, I'm Dave Adams and you've been watching The Core Mechanic.